Hello, and welcome to Temple Street. I'm Ryan O'Connor. I'm Chloe Newland. And I'm Melanie Bleffin. On today's show, we'll discuss the American Jobs Act, hear how the current economic downturn is affecting people in Boston, and take a look at Twitch, a new entrepreneurship competition here at Suffolk. We will also hear from the speech and debate team and interview Betsy McDowell about a new job shadowing program available to sophomores. And as always, we'll end with Critics Corner, where today I have a message for Occupy Wall Street protesters about their true enemy. But first, the news. Recently, reports in the media have focused on the numerous Occupy encampment closures across the nation. Ryan and I took to Tent City in Dewey Square to see how these recent developments are affecting protests in the hub. For over the past two months, members of the Boston community have taken their place in Dewey Square Park to join the nationwide Occupy movement. Utilizing their constitutional rights of free speech and assembly, Protesters hope to raise awareness of America's need to reform Wall Street and relegate its government's self-interest. With few other means in their arsenal, their fight has been a triumph, as the speak out against banks, businesses, and broadcast news companies has been hindered with further external and internal conflicts as well. Taking aim at so many different targets has made it challenging for protesters to explain their cause. What's the point of Occupy? There's so, there's so much because it's basically like the point of it is people are fed up and they don't really know what to do. And so it's like, well, we got to do something. But why not let's just occupy the park for crying out loud and then we'll figure it out. Yet seeing and hearing about the incidents at other encampments across the nation has made the possibility of backlash crystal clear. While stories concerning altercations between protesters and the police have been reported in the media, Boston's message remains one of peace. We do not tolerate any violence against police officers. And honestly, I don't blame the day-to-day uh, -day police officers, the ones you see parked out here. They're just doing a job. Um, violence against them is completely <laughs> meaningless. It is actually detrimental to our cause because we don't want to be known as a violent group. Though with over 90 tents spread out across just a piece of the Rose Kennedy Greenway and filled with people from different backgrounds and different beliefs, protesters understand that they are not all on the same page. Some members of the movement's safety has been endangered due to this inability to regulate who exactly is living amongst them. You know, each person comes with their own bag of goodies that they bring to the party and, you know, it's, uh, we definitely have conflicts here, we definitely have disagreements, and we definitely have, you know, issues, but I'm sure they're the same disagreements and disruptions in, in everybody else's home. Of course there's going to be people involved that are potentially going to not, um, stray, who are potentially going to stray from our peaceful tactics. But the movement as a whole does not condone or tolerate any violence. We have a zero tolerance policy for violence in this occupation and that's from, I've seen that firsthand. Whether facing adversity from others or within, Protesters say they stand strong in their belief that what they have created here in Boston is the start of a crucial public discussion in the nation's history. To think that that if we did ever lose this encampment or the other cities that have lost the encampment, to think that that means that the movement and Occupy will not can, will will stop is to mi completely misunderstand the Occupy movement. By keeping us here, we're allowed to occupy, and they can keep us in one location. If they break up this location, we're not exactly going to disperse. We're just going to spread out and continue the movement in other ways. And that is something to celebrate. For Temple Street, Ryan O'Connor. Boston Mayor Menino stated that protesters must evacuate by 12 p.m. tonight. For more information and constant updates on Occupy Boston, visit OccupyBoston.org. Early this fall, President Barack Obama proposed the American Job Act to counteract the problems of the current economy. Marie Hoffman looked into this federal initiative and how it will serve students here at Suffolk. American Jobs Act, or AJA, presented to the Congress by President Obama on September 8, promises to work for jobless Americans in many ways. The major changes we wish to make for the economy include tax cuts for the firms and workers, increased funding and benefits for the education department, better transportation methods, and improvement of the unemployment insurance in many ways. 
Even though the government has been proposing acts such as this to help the Americans, the unemployment rate is still too for many, including the newly graduates. Suffolk University having a graduation rate of 54% is no exception to this reality and many students are worried for the future. As of right now, I don't have a job for after graduation. I'm, I'm you know, in the interviewing processes. Uh, I'm waiting to hear back from Liberty Mutual. So, as of right now, yeah, I am worried about getting a job. Yes, of course I'm worried going forward. Um, I mean, everybody knows the gloomy state that the job market's in right now. Yet the staff at Career Services and Cooperative Education Office have been giving students advices and are hopeful despite the high unemployment rates. According to Paul Tankrevsky, a director of the Career Services Office, students must have a know-how and be persistent, persuasive, and positive in order to gain a job, even in a healthier market. Students have to be really good about being their own best advocate. And as well as reacting to the marketplace, they need to network, they need to take the initiative to approach employers, they need to leverage their internships. So uh, one of the things I often suggest to them is that they... Uh, um, that they be persistent in their search, that they be prepared. One of the ways students can be creative about looking for jobs is to think globally. Helen Ji Li, a professor of business Chinese, China and Chinese court and U.S.-China exchange consultant who devotes her life to connect American companies and students to China and Chinese companies, knows very well about opportunities outside of the United States as well. It goes a long way if you know some Chinese language. Um, and it will help you to compete globally and to be a truly global citizen. According to Lee, China is a fast-growing country with fascinating, amazing history. She believes that by connecting the two, they will both gain the talent they were looking for and the other better job opportunities. Reporting for Tempo Street, this is Mary Hoffman. You know, I didn't know there were so many options for students to choose from. Me either. It really looks like there's some great opportunities for employment abroad as well. Definitely. Yeah. With the holidays rapidly approaching, Bostonians are feeling the effects of the recession now more than ever. Temple Street reporters Marie Hoffman and Melanie Blethen took to the streets to ask people how the current economic situation is affecting them or someone they know. Well, I think the current economic situation affects everyone. I mean, I think everyone's concerned about how much money they're spending. I mean, I've been fortunate to have a job, but I know a lot of people that haven't ha have lost their jobs and struggled. I was laid off from my job that I was at for 22 years, but it took me 11 months and I did find another job. My salary doesn't change. It hasn't changed for many years and the expenses just keep going higher and higher. Food got more expensive. Gas is more expensive. We're doing okay. My daughter can't live on her own. She has to live with us. I have to help um, my mom with her expenses, her home, keeping her in her home, and that um, depletes all of my savings that I try to put away. I've been through chemotherapy, surgery, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking I need a job. <laughs> now I happen to be homeless, right? and, it, and it's and it is getting more difficult to get into halfway houses and get SSDI. Dreams and hopes seem to be quashed right now because they can't find a basic foundation of a job to support themselves. Um, I can name three people, um, two of my immediate family and one very close friend that just either have recently been laid off or have been laid off within the last year. Like I'm a recent college grad, so of course lots of people have loans and they don't know how they're going to pay, pay them off. Or some people I know, they have, to, they have to go back to grad school. We're nurses, and so one of the issues that we're seeing is um, that graduate nurses are having trouble, have been try having trouble getting some jobs, so they're actually returning for their graduate education. The funding for research is going down as well. For instance, we had some postdoctoral fellows, they just decided to, you know, stop academic career because it's just too much, you know, too difficult. No one's immune from what's happening in the world. America's a huge, huge uh, player in that, a consumer and producer. So if things are happening here, it has an effect elsewhere. It's have had a ripple effect, I mean, in terms of, uh, in terms of everyday living. We're in a global economy now. We're linked, whether we like it or not. 
Well, we certainly hope for better economic news in the near future. New to Suffolk University's business school this year is the Twitch competition. Temple Street reporters Brittany Oschlager and Karina Bolster went to see what this social media contest is all about. Throughout November, business students were encouraged to express their creative ideas through various events and competitions. With this year's motto, Who Will You Work For?, organizers introduced Twitch, a new competition based on last year's elevator race. Instead of having to pitch an idea during the length of an elevator ride in Sawyer, this year's event added social media into the mix. Director of Entrepreneurship Programs George Moker believes events like Twitch give students the opportunity to gain real life skills and be better prepared for a competitive job market. It's a time for students to get outside of the classroom, take some of the knowledge that they've had, take some of the experience that they've also developed and bring it together into a solution or some type of uh, conclusion that they feel that they've accomplished. This year, students' mission was to create a 140 character pitch in Twitter to market the new 2012 Chevy Volt, with the actual tweeting process limited to only 60 seconds. Suffolk's right. professors Dr. Catherine McCabe, Christine Adams, and Teresa Malionak judged the competition. As contestants gathered in a room prior to the competition, they were nervous, but also excited to beat the challenge. A little anxious, a little nervous. I think I'm, overall I'm going to take it home now. I don't know, I'm kind of nervous, kind of excited. Let's see how, how it goes. I feel confident, going to win first place. <laughs> Easy, and locked down. Each student was called out individually from the room, and as the last tweets were coming in, some were looking relieved while others still looked anxious to hear the judges announce the winner. The happy winner receiving the grand prize was Megan Trenfaglia, while Josh Safier and Peter Dooney held third and second place. I got first place, um, very surprised because I thought the, all the tweets were great, um, but I'm very happy and this is my study abroad money. The Center of Entrepreneurship is located on the fourth floor of the Sawyer Building on campus and always has an open door policy, especially for people with good ideas. For Temple Street, I'm Brittany Elschlager. Thank you, Brittany. To see more tweets from the competition, check out Suffolk's Entrepreneur Twitter page at SU Center the number four, E-N-T. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after a short break with Suffolk's debate team, a one-on-one -on -one interview in the studio and Critics Corner. The magical thing about using energy wisely is that anyone can do it. Turn off lights. Use energy-saving light bulbs. And turn off computers and game systems when not in use. Make a change and we can really fly. Grab a grown-up and go online to energy.gov slash kids. Let me drive. I'm not buzzed. No, no, I only had a few. It's my car. I told you to slow down. My dad is going to kill me. You've been drinking? I smell alcohol. Step out of the car, please. You're under arrest for operating under the influence. What was steady constant breath? If you're under 21 and get caught with a trace of alcohol in your blood, you risk being arrested, fined, and losing your license for six months to a year. A little can cost you a lot. Thanks to the Walter M. Burst Forensic Society, the Suffolk Speech and Debate Team has been the starting point for many successful careers. Temple Street's Jeff McHugh and Moss Lynch have the story. Over the last 35 years, Suffolk University has been a strong contender in forensics tournaments around the country. Suffolk students have won titles in Lincoln-Douglas debates, off-the-cuff speaking, persuasion, and impromptu speeches. The university has also been awarded the coveted National Lincoln-Douglas Debate Championship title multiple times. In a forensic competition, the speakers are challenged to find the best way to deliver arguments in dramatic readings. 
president of the National Forensics Association, Larry Schnorr, says success in forensics means much more than knowing how to deliver a speech. Communication skills that one gains through participation in speech and debate are, it cannot be measured in terms of anything other than success. Uh, because in this day and age, communication is one of the most important things that you can have going for you. Former director of the Forensics Society for 27 years, Professor Vicki Carnes agrees and says joining the debate team is the key to a successful career. I think this is the best activity a student can do in college. The number one job skill employers are looking for is the ability to communicate effectively. Nothing's going to make you a better communicator than competing in forensics. Over the years I found that if we have students who are going up for jobs who have competed in forensics and students who are going up for jobs who haven't, almost without exception the students who have the competition and the forensics experience are hired because they're much more effective communicators. Current forensics director Bruce Wickelgren has been heading the team for the last eight years and says he has been so positively affected by the speech competitions that he instills his passion on students every day. I love working with students seeing them grow, uh, letting them find their voice. Um, as a critical theorist, I think it's important that everybody finds their voice that they can use, and forensics is a wonderful vehicle to give people voice. Aiding Bruce, speech professor Jody Navola has been coaching the Suffolk team for 15 years. Forensics for me started in a public speaking class at Northeastern. My teacher said that you should give it a shot. And I went to see a tournament, and I was like, why would anyone do this for fun? and then I tried it and it really made all the difference for me. So much of who I am both professionally and personally is because of forensics. I've been coaching here for 15 years. My kids come to the tournament, my husband comes to the tournaments. I love forensics and I really want to bring what I've learned about forensics to my students. Students never know how forensics can change their life. Could be for a hobby, a job, or for some, even finding the love of their life. Uh, we actually met each other um, through speech, that, and then a couple um, years later, we actually started dating, and uh, now here we are, we, make, we got married, and now we're coaching a speech team in the Northeast. Although he hasn't yet met his future wife, Trevor Ward hopes his two years experience in the team will help spark his career. He says forensics makes him a clearer thinker. When you do impromptu and other speeches, you learn how to speak a lot better. You speak more um, eloquently and more precise, and you know how to organize your thoughts when you speak aloud. Every weekend, Suffolk students, along with students from 200 universities across America, participate in different tournaments held all over the country. And while membership in the team takes hard work and devotion, it also brings people closer together. As students train, work, eat, and celebrate victories together, they are no longer just a team, but also a family. From Temple Street, Jeff McHugh. Suffolk has served as an anchor for the entire East Coast through speech training and national tournaments. Its students and coaches are looking forward to many more years of successful debates. For the very first time, Career Services is offering a job shadowing program for sophomores. Morgan Weedman joined us in the studio for a conversation with the program coordinator, Betsy McDowell. Thank you for joining me, Betsy. You've been Associate Director for Career Services for 21 years now, and this year you're working on the externship program. Can you elaborate a little on this? Sure. The uh, externship uh, slash uh, shadowing, job shadowing program is a program which uh, allows sophomore students to go out uh, over spring break and spend a day or two, uh, and sometimes up to five, um, working with an employer, shadowing that employer to learn more about how their major might be put into practice in the real world. Sounds like a really good program. So how did this program come about to Suffolk University? Well, we'd seen several models, but uh, it really was a collaboration between the Career Services Office and the deans of the College of Arts and Sciences and the Sawyer School um, the Sawyer Business School. So the idea on everyone's part was that sophomores often are at a critical point in their decision-making process about majors and, and they are really obviously by the end of their sophomore year needing to um, make sure they've declared a major and that sometimes the last kind of missing piece that helps them make a decision 
is the opportunity to see, okay, if I major in this, what is it going to mean for my future once I graduate? You said this program could help students see how their majors might translate into a career, which can help them solidify a choice in major. Can you elaborate on the port importance of this opportunity for sophomores? Yes, I think it's, I think one of the things that that happens when you're a sophomore is that that you're in a position where you haven't had a chance to really get into the classes for your major yet. So you're thinking, this major I think makes sense for me, but I'm in a, I've only taken maybe one class so far. I don't really know. What if I end up not really liking it? What if it's not what I thought it was? And so this opportunity gives students this, this um, uh, view into what the field is really all about that's related to their major. So before they get into the classes, they're going to have that chance to have more information that will allow them to feel confident about the choice that they're making as a major. And what is the process of qualifying for this opportunity? Okay, so students need to apply, and generally speaking, we have online applications that you can get through the Career Services website, um, which we'd like to get all the applications in by the end of the first semester. Um, because the matching process, the process of uh, deciding where to place a student, takes us several weeks. We like to make sure that the opportunity is appropriate. We like to make sure that the um, employer sponsor, you know, has, um, is able to offer what a student really wants to learn. So that matching process takes some time. It's kind of like putting a giant jigsaw puzzle <laughs> together. So what we ask of students is that they do a couple of things in their application. One is that they actually identify a couple of different choices for areas of interest, um, career interest. And the second thing is that they provide us with a little statement about what they uh, hope to get out of the program, why they're interested in, in it, so kind of a, a paragraph or two which is really articulating what they're hoping to do and why, why they decided they wanted to participate. And then the third thing is a, a resume. Is, and if a student does not have a resume, we will be happy to work with them on that and putting that together because all of the employers want to see the resumes of mm -hmm. the students that are coming to visit them. Yes. What are some examples of jobs that students can have the opportunity to shadow for the week of spring break? Great question. Um, we've had, for example, we had a, a, a couple science students, environmental science students, uh, um, go up to Gloucester to um, work with an alum who is uh, working for the National Oceanic and Administration and Atmospheric Administration oh, wow. um, and Shadow there. We have okay. had some students go to KPMG, the large public accounting firm, and do some shadowing there. We've had students go to law firms. We had one student who spent a couple days with a, with a um, commercial salesperson on all their, on all their calls. Um, wow. We had a couple students go to New England Cable News and spend one day in the studio and one day shadowing a reporter um, and out in the field with them. So it's a real, a real variety of different opportunities. So they get a feel for what it's like to be in the day in that job. Exactly. It's very good. Exactly. We talked to them about how to follow up with that employer afterwards, how to write a thank you note, how to set up perhaps um, the opportunity to stay in touch with that. Uh, that sponsor probably 90 percent, 85 to 90 percent, are Suffolk alumni who have offered to to be the employer sponsors for the students. That's really good that it's Suffolk <coughs> alumni because then, I mean, they were in these shoes one day, so they can learn from them and see what they did to follow that path. Yes, and a lot of a lot of alums love the opportunity to give back to Suffolk yes. in this way. It's a way for them to kind of feel like they're contributing to the ongoing life of of the college while they're mm -hmm. out there in the real world, so they enjoy it. It's very good. And how do more than one student attend the same company to shadow? You know, it, it kind of it has, it varies. Um, the, the largest group of students that goes to one place is we have a, um, is our criminal justice um, connection with the Department of Corrections, where we usually have four or five students go that day. Um, and those four or five students, the Department of Corrections has set up a whole day for them where they, they do a variety of things and they're down in the Norfolk uh, Correctional Facility, which is quite an experience for them um, <laughs> sure. because they have to follow all the rules to mm -hmm. keep 
to ensure their safety and they're kept perfectly safe that day. Can this experience with even one or two days um, benefit the sophomores who participate in this program? Well, you know, it's been uh, amazing. Um, we've had s uh, students come back and, and say kind of things that we've already discussed in terms of, wow, this really gave me an idea of what I'm going to be doing and I'm really excited about my major and they kind of make a, a much more um, serious commitment to what their studies are. We've had students come back and say, you know, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, but I've changed my mind. Um, we've had students get internships, um, two or three uh, sites a year. If they have a good a couple of days experience with that, students will say, gee, do you want to come back in the summer oh, for wow. a full internship? Um, so it's really been great. It does seem great. What advice would you give students who are participating in this program? My most important piece of advice is take it seriously because those students who really go that day um, thinking about it as, a, as, as an entree into their pro potential professional life have really been the ones who have gotten those benefits of things like internships or contacts for the future, um, things like that. So it's really made a difference for those students. That's simple advice, but it does sound true, yeah. yes. Because it, it's, you're only helping yourself. So. Exactly. Yeah. It's an opportunity that you can't pass up. I agree. I think it sounds like a great program and a great addition to Suffolk University. Thank you very much, Betsy, for coming out. You're welcome. Thanks. And back to you guys in the studio. Wow, I really wish I had that opportunity when I was a sophomore. I agree. I hope they realize what a great opportunity this is, though. Absolutely. And now we turn to Melanie Blethin for Critics Corner. Melanie, having just done a piece on Occupy, I'd really like to know what your message is about this new enemy for protesters. Thanks, Ryan. As we've seen on today's show, the current state of the country's economy is obviously big news, as it should be. And the reality of this economic, situ economic recession is that financial giants targeted by Occupy Wall Street protesters are in fact greedy suits refusing to create jobs in an attempt to keep their exuberant salaries, expensive yachts, and numerous vacations. While these protesters like to preach and comment on the disparity of wealth felt between elitist rich Americans and the remaining 99%, it seems that these activists are not concerned with what I think is such a painfully obvious realization. The movement's righteous goals or honorable intentions are meaningless when its supporters are fixated on the wrong enemy. Wake up, guys. There's more than one bad guy, or should I say bad girl? Yes, that's right. We're talking about the one and only Kim Kardashian. I mean, really. Does no one else see the problem with gigantic the, the gigantic difference in pay between people like Kim Kardashian and the average American? So can one of these liberals please stand up and protest of the obscene level of attention we as a society give its most useless members? This movement cannot advocate for fairness or more evenly dispersed wages while we as a society still place the most undeserving individuals upon a pedestal. We hoisted people like Snooki, Paris Hilton, and Kim Kardashian, just to name a few, into the limelight that they so desired, and what has the result been? Well, as of October 31st, Kardashian, for instance, filed for her second divorce at the age of 31, a mere 72 days after exchanging vows with New Jersey Nets forward Chris Humphreys. Naturally, celebrity weddings often turn out to be leading news stories, but remember, we're not talking about an accomplished or talented performer here. We're talking about a woman who is famous for being famous. Now, this abomination is able to drop millions of dollars on a fairy tale wedding. How do you spend $2 million on roses? The best part is, she didn't even pay for this wedding with her hard-earned millions. Instead, the vendors participating in her big day provided the socialite with so many discounts in return for the exposure that she didn't pay a cent, not one penny. In fact, she turned a profit. Yes, the estimated amount the Kardashian had earned from her stage jumptuals could send a village to college, literally hundreds of kids, and I wish I was exaggerating. Essentially, my point is that, in the midst of a recession, we as Americans still refuse to donate to reputable ch charities canvassing city streets, supposedly because we cannot afford to. We won't even give away the forgotten loose change living in the depths of our wallets and purses. But how many of us turned on E! last month to watch Kim strut down the aisle? The answer, 4.4 million. Every time we acknowledge these tabloid queens, we are just throwing more money at them, money they never earned. And why didn't we learn our lesson with Paris Hilton? Hilton, whose fame also comes from her filthy rich parents, is now able to make her own money producing sex tapes and releasing repugnant self-titled fragrances? It doesn't get more self-absorbed than that. And in fact, it is because of Paris that Kim is a celebutant. They used to be gal pals. We didn't stomp out the first fame whore because we were hoping she would die out, and most of them eventually do die out, but why do we wait? While I feared I was alone in my disgust, I was glad to discover an online petition asking E to cancel the Kardashian series. 
Even British actor Daniel Craig, that's right, even 007 is part of the petition, said that Kim and her kin are causing viewers to believe that if you act like an idiot on television, then they'll pay you millions. And if you don't want to take the word of James Bond seriously, will you listen to the White House? The First Lady told E! News that the Obamas are one family that certainly won't be keeping up with the Kardashians, as the First Family thinks they are a bad influence on young girls. Was that ever even a topic of debate? The FAM spin-off show just released their newest season, with the plot of the first episode revolving around naked yoga? Can you honestly sit back and tell me our corporations are the only enemy? Okay, corporations may have stolen your money, but Ms. Kardashian, you just stole my faith in humanity. I think I'll take the three Vera Wang dresses, but I'll leave the messy ending. <laughs> One would think with the NBA lockout, too, that Chris Humphreys would have some time to kind of think this through before he went through with it. Definitely. Oh, well. Well, thank you for joining us on another edition of Temple Street. I'm Ryan O'Connor. I'm Chloe Newland. And I'm Melanie Blathen. See you next time.